Welcome everyone. My name is Jack Chen. I'm privileged to be the director of the Clement A. Price Institute of Ethnicity, Culture, and the Modern Experience at Rutgers University, Newark. The Price Institute is committed to deeply engaged collaborative community building, especially with those who have been historically and chronically dispossessed and disenfranchised from basic rights and well-being. Those injustices degrade us all. I hope you and yours are managing okay during this unprecedented and history-making time. COVID-19 is understood as a storm that has hit the entire globe more or less at the same time. And it has been said, we are all in the same boat. Yet, we know this is not quite true. Uh, we might all be hit by the same storm, but we are not all in the same boat. Some of our boats are luxurious with plenty of food and drink. Actually, none of the people who are on the panel today <laughs> are from that point of view, uh, wired for broadband connectivity, while so many other boats are barely staying afloat. Certainly, this is about the basics of wealth and power everywhere, but it's also about the particular histories and political cultures of each region and nation state. It is in this frame I want to make the acknowledgement we are in the lands of the Munsi Lenape peoples, the grandparents of the Algonquian language uh, speaking peoples, uh, who have been in this estuarial watershed region for thousands and thousands of years. It is the Munsi Lenape who have managed the lands and waters in such a bountiful way, and that when in 1609 Henry Hudson, hired by the Dutch uh, aristocracy to identify a fabled Northwest Passage to coveted luxury goods of the so-called Orient. They were looking for a shortcut. Um, the, uh, they came upon um, this amazing estuary and were greeted by Muncie Lenape peoples. For the colonizing Dutch and English Protestants, they felt they arrived in the biblical Garden of Eden, and they could simply extract to their endless desires. The Pope's doctrine of discovery gave the stamp of Christian civilizational authority to plant a flag and to claim the soil, water, and all on it. The settler colonists' old world pigs uh, that they brought with them, uh, breaking out of their pens, soon spread diseases that wiped out an estimated 70% or more of Muncie Lenape who were here. Such pandemics are clearly not new to our region, nor to the world. This is in this context in which this session has been organized. Uh, Gardens That Free Us, Urban Gardening, Sustainability, and Healing explores ultimately what freedom can truly mean at a time when so many people are out of paid work and can't purchase seeds to grow edible gardens. Uh, thanks to Professor Alexandra Chang for pulling together this distinguished panel. I know clan mother uh, Michaeline Picaro Mann has stories of ancient seeds that she is reintroducing to these lands. Uh, I just also learned that enslaved Africans who first, brought, who first were um, enslaved uh, and, and brought on those horrific ships, uh, colonial ships, they not only um, came with their bodies, but they also brought seeds, oftentimes woven and braided into their hair. And these seeds were then oftentimes replanted into the places that they had ended up uh, working um, and tilling the soil for. So it's not only the difficult historical stories that we're, that we're mentioning today and talking about today, but it's also celebrating really the beauty and joy uh, of how people have survived and made new lives in this, uh, in this ancient world that's here. So it's really with that framing that I wanted to really welcome and thank all the people who are uh, presenting. Um, I also wanted to thank um, the great uh, Price Institute staff, uh, Jessica Hernandez especially, who's done a lot of the heavy lifting for this particular program, but also Marianne uh, Mann and also Claudia Sepulveda. And I wanted to thank um, the Mellon Foundation and the LNM uh, folks as well. Uh, for helping to support the work we do. So without any more delay, I want to introduce Alexandra Chang. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Jack, for that amazing introduction and background. 
really of our area and also the history of extraction right and dispossession of our time and um, how it really comes into our time and that beautiful imagery of the seeds and the hair. Um, I'm Alexandra Chang and I'm the Interim Associate Director at the Price Institute as well as a Professor of Practice at the Arts, Culture and Media Department at Rutgers at Newark and I'm really really grateful for everyone gathering today this afternoon for the program Gardens That Free Us, Urban Gardening, Sustainability and Healing with Jamie Bruno, Micheline Picara, and Tobias Fox. I just wanted to note just in the beginning here just a, li a little bit about um, uh, what we're going to be doing today. So first, the panelists are going to talk a bit about their work, and then we'll have a little cross discussion. And then that will lead to an opportunity for you to also join in on the discussion and ask questions to the panelists. So if you do have questions, please feel free to um, post them in the chat. If you could mark it with an asterisk, that helps us to indicate that you want to ask this question. So put an asterisk in the question in the chat if you're on Zoom. And if you're on Facebook, also please feel free to put your questions in the chat and they'll be transferred over to the Zoom for us. Also, if you could please um, put your mics on mute uh, throughout the session, that would be very helpful. And also um, just to note that you can sign up for our listserv if you're interested in um, events like this and other events um, at the Institute. And it's also posted in the chat so you can sign up through there. So this event is going to be recorded. So if anyone doesn't want to show up like with your face in the recording, just simply you know, um, disable your camera. Okay, so gardens. Gardens are often seen as something that is a passive place for contemplation and rest or something that you would work on perhaps when you're retired, right? But what if we saw gardening as something that was in fact um, something that was one of the most important centers of advocacy and a force of agency, allowing us to tackle important society structural failures that have been exasperated by COVID and economic inequalities historically. What if we saw gardens as a space that reconnects us to our multi-species existence and aids us to work away from ecological and climate crises to sustainable community-wide practices of urban farming, community resilience, local markets, and foodways, and working through our increasing divide between our food, our land, and accessibility to land, nature, and ourselves. What if we saw gardens as spirituality, as healing generations of traumas, and connecting us with ancestors, our histories, and our pasts, as we rethink how we might go forward armed with new and old knowledges into this our post-COVID futures. So I'm really glad to have with us today three New Jersey-based community farmers who are also policy advocates, community leaders, and artists and creatives themselves. I'd like to welcome New York-based Jamie Bruno, who I first started to uh, speak about community gardens with when planning an eco-art salon um, which she presented at the Rutgers Paul Robeson Gallery um, er, uh, later last year. And um, this, is, this was a program that the Price also supports. And Jamie is an artist. Um, she's a food environmental justice advocate. And she's also a multidisciplinary artist with a focus on environmental art and installation. Over the past two years, she's championed the necessity to include accessible pathways for micro and small volume composting in New Jersey at community gardens and urban farms. In 2017, she co-founded nonprofit Urban Agriculture Cooperative to support the development and resilience of urban environmental practice and to help create more resilient and uh, to help create more resilience and sovereignty within Newark's food shed. Jamie has engaged in residencies in the Newark Print Shop Lower Raritan Watershed uh, Partnership, uh, which was under an NEA grant, and Space Beam in Incheon, South Korea. And she lives, works, and gardens in Newark. I also wanted to welcome Micheline Picaro, whose artistic practice in, is enmeshed with her work as a healer. Um, she is a member, or um, actually she's a clan mother, um, of the Ramapo Lunape Nation and has recently organized a new community garden space in northern New Jersey with her community. She's a mother artist, nurse, and healer. Her concern for the effects of industry and the depletion of farming fields on the environment has forwarded her interest in plants in terms of whole systems approaches to community farming, as well as holistic health, wellness, and spiritual connectivity. Her nursing 
holistic energy healing and art backgrounds have allowed her to experience different modes of thinking in terms of healing and education and encouraged her, uh, her continued journey with natural medicine for healing and food foraging. So welcome, Mikaline. I also wanted to note that we'll be joined by Newark-based Tobias Fox. Tobias is the founder and managing director of the community-driven 501c3 nonprofit organization, Newark Science and Sustainability, Inc. Aside from being a writer for 10 years and um, part of the independent publishing uh, field, Fox is also a professional organizer, urban farmer, photographer, and coordinator of the annual Sustainable Living Empowerment Conference. He conducts various community events, presentations, and workshops on sustainable living, living practices and has assisted numerous urban farmers and gardeners with the cultivation of their agricultural space. So thank you everyone and welcome. Um, Tobias, I wanted to ask you if you might be able to start us off today uh, to talk a little bit about your activist work and also how you see the garden as a possibility um, as a place where you might free oneself in relationship to your work with Occupy, as well as Science and Sustainability, which you founded. Well, I think he's on mute. I am, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, well, thank you for having me. Uh, this is great. And um, I would like to uh, take you all uh, through the experiences of the work that I do in North Science and Sustainability uh, by way of a uh, slide so, slow, slideshow presentation, if I can. And let me just take this off. I want to share my screen. Cool. <clears throat> and I want to, uh, I'm going to try to just, uh, I want to, kind of narrate over these uh, slideshows and um, excuse me, of these slides. And I would like to go through them um, rather quickly, but not too fast, but rather quickly because I'm excited to be sharing this panel um, with uh, two awesome people, two other awesome people. So, and uh, let's see, oops. All right, here we go. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me try and do this from the beginning. Come on now. Bear with me. Uh, stop. Let's try this one more again. No, I'm trying to enlarge it. It won't, it won't enlarge on my screen. So I guess I'm going to have to just keep it like this and just, just go through it, you know? And I want to try one more thing, one more thing. Okay, here we go. Yes, no, come on. All right, here we go, got it. <clears throat> All right, so, um, According to scientific reports, climate change is one of the most crucial concerns that will determine the fate of human survival. Reported by a variety of New Jersey news sources, the effects of Hurricane Sandy in New Jersey in 2012 were severe, with economic losses to businesses of up to $30 billion. Over 2 million households across the state lost power during the storm, 346,000 homes were damaged or destroyed, and 37 people were killed. In the United States, the Environmental Protection Agency estimates that more food reaches landfills and incinerators than any other single material in our everyday trash. By keeping wholesome and nutritious food in our communities and out of landfills, we can help address the 42 million Americans that live 
Americans that live in food insecure households. This would also have a tremendous impact on our climate. Roughly 44.2% of New Jersey's urban children, that's ages three to 18, are overweight or obese. Causes include poor nutrition education coupled with food deserts. These are areas that lack access to healthy food, a predominant issue in minority and low-income urban neighborhoods. First out of the Occupy Wall Street movement in 2011, Newark Science and Sustainability Inc. is a community-driven 501c3 nonprofit organization based in Newark uh, that assists with the creation of self-sustaining and environmentally friendly communities by developing pathways for green jobs, increased self-sufficiency, and broader community empowerment. We achieve this through collaborations and partnerships with residents, community-based organizations, and other key stakeholders, including local businesses. Since 2012, with little to no financial resources, we've managed to make an impact in our community by implementing various initiatives to increase awareness of environmental, ecological, and wellness issues through educational programs and hands-on activities. It is through our five pillars that initiatives and programs are formed, making us a highly project-driven organization. Our pillars uh, provide an interdisciplinary approach to learning, through this process, we believe individuals will become more informed about their environment and therefore more likely to have a holistic understanding of themselves and the world they inhabit. Our renewable energy program introduced uh, practical uses of solar, wind, pedal bike generators, and energy storage or battery packs. Participants also become better informed about climate issues and how to be, to be more climate resilient as they implement renewable energy into their community. In this photo, you see me making smoothies from the power that's being created by the pedal bike, which we call our pedal bike powered smoothie bar. Eco art is the use of natural and recycled materials to create, enhance, and interact with the environment. Participants are in, introduced to eco art as a means for self-expression, beautification, and personal engagement with, uh, excuse me, and connection with the natural world. Through this initiative, we are able to integrate art with urban agricultural practices and community engagement. Art Grows in Newark is a program that grows out of our Eco Art Initiative, focusing on ages four and five-year-olds. Art Grows in Newark integrates visual arts and art therapy with urban agricultural practices in order to foster environmental stewardship, strong community engagement, and a culture of hope and social change. Our wellness and nutrition program involved nutritional education and events in which participants engage with nutritional food and information. The Healing Properties of Herbs is a workshop that grows out of our wellness and nutrition initiative. In this workshop, we review common herbs that are grown indoors, outdoors, or can be found in almost everyone's kitchen and learn about their effect on the body and how to use them. The workshop includes a hands-on do-it-yourself component in which participants create and take home an herbal remedy for their own use. <clears throat> Our ecological building program examines passive solar construction and other unconventional building methods that operates within the laws of nature and advocates for the use of local affordable materials. This is an urban farm project that we are currently developing in Newark. It will become our headquarters and an agricultural hub center. This is, in fact, the redevelopment of our Garden of Hope. This second community green development uh, project is our Aisha Farmers Market and Cafe. The first level will have a rustic uh, cafe style farmers market. The second level will hold office space. The third level will have apartments and the fourth level will have a green roof. Our our Third green community development project is our renewable energy demonstration space, which would uh, help people become more connected with the uses of renewable energy, specifically solar, wind, and pedal bike technology. Urban agriculture, the localization of food production, which mostly consists of transforming vacant lots or warehouses into community gardens or urban farms. Operating through the city's Adopt a Lot program where uh, we're able to adopt uh, vacant lots like the one you see here from the city of Newark for a dollar 
and renew the lease annually. The purpose of adopting these lots is to transform them into a green space for community use. Now we adopted this lot in 2015 and transformed it into the Garden of Hope. It is our belief that gardens in and of themselves are the real life symbols of hope. Our gardens invigorate people's senses during the day-to-day -day hustle and bustle. We've been able to transform abandonment into sustainability. The gardens become a gathering place where strangers become friends and to ponder their thoughts amongst the beauty of the garden. We're now working on transforming this garden into a year-round sustainable urban farm. It will be the first of its kind in North. We'll have an administration facility with a restroom, a walk-in cooler uh, to store produce, a farm stand to sell our produce, and other added value products, a tool shed, a commercial kitchen, a hydroponic greenhouse, and a chicken coop. We'll also be collecting rainwater to run through the greenhouse, and we'll have solar technology to help offset our energy costs. Through our Urban Agriculture Initiative, participants learn the art of gardening and farming in urban environments. Our focus areas include plant management, produce distribution, and increasing residents' access to healthy food. With the redevelopment of the Garden of Hope, it will allow us to expand our farm to table co-op of 15 members and support up to 50 members. In 2018, we launched our farm to table co-op which follows the model of a community supported agriculture or CSA program, a system in which a farm operation is supported by shareholders within the community. Individuals are able to make an advance payment of $395 to receive weekly fresh locally grown produce. Um, which feeds up to two to four people, excuse me, for 20 weeks. That's from June to October. There are those who find $395 to be a financial burden, so we launch our Sponsor Family Initiative, which allows people to purchase a membership and then donate it to a family in need. Here are two of our community gardens during the peak season, which members of our farm to table, with members of our farm to table co-op. There's also our Sustainability Ambassador Program, geared toward youth ages 11 to 16. Sustainability ambassadors help promote sustainable living practices such as healthy eating, active living, urban farming, and clean energy in their homes, faith organizations, schools, and other networks to which they may belong. The program run, runs for six weeks over the summer, and the ambassadors engage in a wide variety of hands-on learning activities, including field trips that are focused on our five pillars. Through the solicitation of donations and grants, the program is free and lunch is also provided. Working in collaboration with Whole Cities Foundation, Newark Science and Sustainability Inc. functions as the Newark Community Food System Facilitation and Support Team. By stringing together a network of Newark-based growers, the Newark Community Food System, an innovative collective of local urban agriculture experts, supports the growth of the local food system, amplify community-led initiatives, and develop sustainability around urban agriculture and fresh, healthy food access. The purpose of the Sustainable Living Empowerment Conference is to inspire and empower attendees so they become active participants toward the goal of building healthy, sustainable communities. The speakers use their own experiences and values to convey how they have been driven by their passions to various achievements. From urban farming to health and wellness, the speakers share information and ex experiences that assist with the creation of sustainable communities. Our week-long garden tour provides an opportunity for residents and visitors to become more informed about the various agricultural spaces that exist throughout North. This event also serves as a means to encourage healthy eating, healthy living practices, and environmental education. Through a series of workshops and reaping, and by reaping the benefits from the harvest of each of the, of, of the participating spaces, residents walk away with healthy, locally grown produce and a broader awareness of environmental stewardship. Here are a series of activities that are occurring at a few of the gardens during the uh, last year's garden tour. We have yoga in the garden, an herbalism workshop, harvesting, a potluck, and hands-on learning activities for youth. By working in collaboration with the Urban Agriculture Cooperative, we not only demonstrate how agriculture contributes to the health and well-being of a community, but also the local economy. 
which is why we help facilitate these pop-up farm stands and farmers markets. The purpose of the, uh, of the uh, North's Harvest, a farm to table community mill, is to bring about a true sense of community through the natural unifier of food. This event allows residents to come together and break bread with one another. This meal is accompanied by sustainable living vendors and entertainment. I have, uh, I have to add that um, this event is also zero waste, meaning that residents are required to bring their own utensils, plates, and cups. So we understand that food is a social act. It brings people together. This community mill was set up for 200 residents in this North neighborhood to come out of their homes, engage with one another, and indulge in topics related to their environmental and social issues. Much of the food was donated from the gardens and urban farms throughout North. We plan to make this first time event an annual affair. As you see here in all the uh, photos I shared in this presentation, we were just recently displaying public affection, and now we have to learn how to distance ourselves from one another. Great. Thank you so much, Tobias, for that. Um, it, I, I'm amazed that you have any time <laughs> you like to do anything. That range of work that you're doing, encouraging like really needed and effective uh, environmental education, wellness and healing. I mean, just so much going on. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that. So we'll talk a bit more about that um, in our cross discussion. Um, Jamie, I would love to invite you now to talk more about your work. Um, we've been speaking so long about gardens and your practice and advocacy. I'm so excited to, um, to talk more. And um, if you could share about your work as not only being an artist, but also the co-founder of Urban Agriculture Co Cooperative. Um, yeah, sure. Um, uh, so I will also share my screen, but I also want to like just thank the Price Institute for organizing this and especially you, Alexandra, because you've been such a huge champion, I guess, of environmental art here in Newark and we're like really lucky and blessed to have you. Um, also, I'm just really excited for everyone um, that everyone's here right now. Um, I am really looking forward to hearing all of your thoughts and your questions and all that. So I'm just gonna share, uh, let's see if I can get this up. Uh, is that, can, can we confirm that that's working? <laughs> okay, great. So yeah, um, I'm just gonna, you know, share a little bit about my history and how it connects to kind of the heart of my, my work. Um, I grew up in, you know, North Jersey. I graduated from Rutgers with a Bachelor of Fine Arts in 2008. And in many ways, my uh, turn to environmental practice was my kind of personal reaction to the art world and art practice. Um, you know, at the time I graduated, uh, the world population was 6.7 billion, the carbon dioxide level was 300 parts per million, which is 40% lower than it is now, and the US housing market had just crashed. <laughs> but I wasn't thinking about all of this yet. I wasn't really thinking about sustainability. What I was thinking about was, my own art activism and practice, and what my practice might look like if I found success in the art world. Um, I was pretty critical, traditional endpoints uh, of either gallery representation or an academic career at that time seemed to me only to like reinforce historical class division. And you know, although I was a part of this incredible DIY community um, of really talented artists, I was just loath to linking my own success and survival to the creation of like these expensive art goods. And it also might a little bit be my own practicality that drove me towards the environment. My grandfather kept a garden and I just really felt the need to, you know, see real positive change like manifest. Um, so, after I graduated, yeah, I didn't know much about sustainability, but a couple of years later, on a short break from living and working in Seoul, South Korea, uh, a couple of friends drove me to North Carolina to begin a six-month backpacking trip across these small farms of the southern United States. 
So I visited North Carolina, Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, Arizona. <laughs> I lived with all sorts of people, people intentionally living under the poverty line as a protest to capitalism. I lived with off the grid Republicans. I lived with Hare Krishna communities, um, but they were all driven by this same idea of subsistence and resilience. Uh, I learned what it's like to live alone months on end with only animals and plants surrounding you. Um, at the time, I called this trip Level Hand because my intention was to look into different styles of living and to discover my own self-sufficiency self in communication with the earth. Um, what I actually learned though were the visions and incredible variety of the people who made it their personal responsibility to bear the benefit and often the burdens of sustainable change. Um, there were many approaches from many persuasions and like any subculture, their commitment to their ideals worn into their faces have lined new seeds of inspiration in the soil of popular culture. <laughs> it was 2011 and this experience was my seed to my current work and uh, environmental justice and art. So these are just more of a selection of images. This was the Hare Krishna farm. They had a uh, sacred cow graveyard and, you know, just different, um, you know, experiences. Again, the Hare Krishna farm, amazing, the amazing quality of pea shoots, doing interesting things that I could never do in art. <laughs> um, this was a uh, farm in Texas that I lived in um, during tornado season and we all lived in greenhouses and U-Hauls. It was kind of scary. Some weird stuff you find in the south. Um, opium poppies. Uh, this is um, milking a cow. That was Gita. She was a pain in the butt. Um, and you know, dealing with like death on a farm is not ever easy of animals. It's a farm in Mississippi. Um, yeah, quiet. It was very quiet, you know, often in these communities. This looks scary, but it's just a battery system for solar panels in Arizona. Um, yeah, elephant, uh, it like, looks like elephant. It's cow poop. <laughs> The Hare Krishna um, farm in Texas. This is the off the grid site in Arizona again. And I think that's it. So I'm going to move on pretty quickly. Um, you know, here um, in my work and in so much of my wanderings, I, I really explore the nature of exchange and human connection and resilience. And I want to share um, an excerpt from a compilation of texts called Alternative Art Economies, a primer. It was assembled for a workshop at Trade School New York in spring 2011, uh, and I utilized it in kind of an art concept as exhibition event called uh, Barter Lines, which was basically a gallery pop-up that set up an online system for the public to exchange in anything but money for pieces of artwork. So basically, we got a lot of interesting offers. Uh, restaurateurs gave away free weekly meals for an artwork. Dentists gave away free exams and operations. There were offers for photography, studio space donations. And there was also some unusual funny offers like that I probably should have mentioned here, a little off color. Um, but uh, I'm gonna basically read this next excerpt, this ex excerpt you see on the right side, but I'm gonna change it a little bit um, because here I just want to collectively vision um, kind of what we're talking about, like plants, food, and food systems, and healing. So I'll just start, and I'm going to do a little twist. So in, in imagining the possibility of a food economy based on mutual aid, the principle uh, that an enterprise or association should be owned and controlled by the people it serves, versus one based on financial speculation, some questions emerge. How do economic policies and structures affect food production? What is the relationship between farmers and non-farm communities? Between farmers and city policy? Between farmers and global, global trade? 
Can urban and small farm communities use their skill sets to reallocate market demand from conventional corporate farms to a food system based on food sovereignty and food justice? How do specific forms of behavior among farmers and urban agriculturists, hypervisibility, egoism, and competitiveness, even on our small little network here, uh, exacerbate, exacerbate our ability to work together and share resources and create change? What kind of economic structures could transform this behavior? Can different uh, kinds of behavior yield different economic possibilities? And so I'll just include, this is the, the different pictures from that event. Macho boyfriend for one day, what fun. Nobody's gonna take that bit. <laughs> um, so anyway, these are the questions that really drove, I'm just gonna leave it on this slide, it's not really relevant, but um, these are the questions that drove my work in urban agriculture and that inform my approach as a founding member and the program director for Urban Agriculture Cooperative. Um, the history of farming in the USA is a painful history, one that is tied to slavery and the history of our food system and agricultural subsidies are tied up in that history as well. Oops, I forgot there was sound there. If you're here today, uh, then you likely know that the industrial farm, uh, that industrial farm chemical fertilizers and toxic pesticides devastate our ecosystems with erosion and algal blooms and also harm our bodies. So there is a groundswell, and especially in post-industrial post -industrial communities of color that aims to create empowerment and sovereignty and sovereignty in the environment and food. In Newark, these projects are created and amplified by people and organizations like Tobias of Newark SAF, Amaryllis Olivo of Garden of Worker Bees, Kevin and Amaryllis of the Rabbit Hole Farm, Greater Newark Conservancy's Plot at Fresh program, and there's so many others. Um, these projects uh, create healing and safe spaces where there were none. Each year that goes by, I ask myself questions about food sovereignty. And this is more visioning, you know? Um, are we more resilient than we were a year ago? How interested does my community seem to food justice issues? How can we, pre how can we create more ownership in food justice? Were any of our local uh, agricultural community members able to actually purchase their lots, which Iha Tobias has. Um, ha and then also, did anyone lose their lot to a city development project, which happens much more often. Um, so working together, you know, it's imperative kind of to, to fight, a it's imperative to our survival to kind of fight against the, and how, so how is working together imperative to fighting the industrial food system? How can we work together? How can we lift each other up? I think again, Tobias has, and Mickey will show some incredible examples of that, but also I'll share some um, background and examples of Urban Ag Cooperative, which I'm the co-founder and now program director of. So oh, I wanted to share these. These are uh, Newark-based images of farms, and I'm ho I hope I'm not going too long. Uh, this is the Urban Ag Farmer's Market. This is a uh, rabbit hole farm, which is some potatoes. Oh yeah, okay, good. Um, so that's actually where, you know, talk. I forgot what we were talking about there, but that was a meeting at City Hall where a bunch of urban agriculture practitioners of different organizations came together. And I think it might've been about the adopt a lot and, or adjusting the adopt a lot policy. Um, so basically, Urban Agriculture Cooperative, our mission is to localize and densify the food system while providing increased healthy food access to empowered urban communities. So we want to spur food sovereignty, food sovereignty by sharing access and knowledge within the food shed. You can kind of think of our work as a balance between healthy food access for communities and equitable and en environmental development of urban agriculture entrepreneurships. So we engage in bulk purchasing of soil or compost. And most recently, we're, uh, we've been providing subsidies for um, like farmer and food handler trainings. Uh, we coordinate, also, we also coordinate some testing um, for farms to know what's in their soil. And that's a picture of Edwin and his uh, work partner from the, U, uh, uh, the uh, US uh, 
what is it, from the Natural Resource Conservation Conservation Service. They come out and they test uh, public sites and they give incredibly comprehensive feedback on, you know, your whole site, which is really helpful. And you can see like some sites definitely need remediation um, and lead, it has been an issue. So the more information, like this is what we have to work with. This is, so the more information, the more we can create health in our communities. And it's about, you know, it's about that access and knowledge so that we can do that change. Um, also, let me see, we're, we're engaging a lot of compost uh, policy right now with urban ag. So we are advocating to the state and the NJDP to allow composting at community gardens, uh, i.e. food scraps being brought to a community garden for um, small volume uh, processing into soil, like healthy compost. Um, so this is something that people that live in the suburbs and rural um, uh, communities, they can do in their backyards, but often when you're living in an urban community, you don't have access to a backyard. So, you know, your community garden is where you would do that. And um, it's technically illegal to do that in the state of New Jersey. There's an on-site, off-site rule. Um, it's not enforceable, but community gardens can't add composting um, to like a potential revenue stream to create their own resilience there. They can't really scale. Um, so we're trying to, you know, directly, you know, try, um, you know, present that to the NJDEP. It's been a really long road. We've been doing this since 2018 and we, it's, we're still like kind of struggling with them and I could share more, but um, I'm gonna move on to the next project. Oh yeah, that's our petition to allow small volume composting, which is viewable on NJDEP's New Jersey Department of Environmental uh, Protection, if I didn't say it uh, earlier, um, uh, website. Oh, and I do have a link, which I guess I could share in the chat. <laughs> um, and then also this, the, because of COVID, we often, or, you know, as you saw in Devise's slide, um, we do farmer's markets and we'll, um, we, uh, we love our farmer's markets. We run a, a farmer's markets throughout the city. Um, and we provide, we often like um, ask for like excess produce from community gardens and we'll also, um, work with some rural farms as well. Um, but because of COVID, we've had to pivot. So we're offering a, um, a basically an online farmer's market, which has actually spurred the beginnings of a food hub. So our supplier, we're, we have a rural linkage, but we're really um, working with primarily Newark suppliers. And we're really excited about it because it's created a lot of uh, kind of in, like interest and development uh, opportunity for them. like getting a general liability insurance where there was none or um, figuring out what pricing looks like also through the help of a um, data, uh, I think presentation that Tobias did actually a, a month ago. Um, and I think with that, um, that's the end of my presentation, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jamie, that was wonderful. Um, it, I mean, it was so interesting to hear about the idea of access so many different levels of access there. And then also um, really poignant to see those photos, I think of the animals that you were, you were buried, right? And had like yeah. cow funerals um, in that interrelationship between, you know, beyond the human um, that you able, were able to cultivate in those spaces. And I think um, that might seg a little bit also to uh, what Micheline will be talking about because um, thinking about spirituality as well as healing um, in, in her work. And so Micheline, if you wouldn't mind to um, come online and uh, present about your work and thoughts on gardens as a healing space in terms of the health of the body and the spirit through your practices as an artist, as well as a healer and a nurse, and also um, recently establishing a garden this year in Northern New Jersey in your community. Hi, thank you everybody for sharing everything. It was absolutely wonderful. Um, in listening to everybody, I can see that we all sort of have the same philosophies and a lot of those philosophies are um, you know food food is a good thing food can be healing food can be healing nutritionally but it's also healing in many other ways um, I think um, you know well gosh where do we start um, 
I think I see a lot of us coming back to the fact that we're beginning to realize that um, independency, self-reliance is a really good thing right now, um, especially now with COVID. Um, we see a lot of these victory gardens that are starting to pop up. Um, and we haven't seen those except for in time of war when pretty much the same thing has kind of happened where there's been a lot of, um, you know, fear and panic and uh, supermarket runs, so to speak. And so we're seeing that food is important again. And not only that, but I mean, if we really take into consideration what has happened to our food sources over the years um we have given it all over to these big conglomerations and we really don't know where our food is grown what's it what really is it grown in what is the soil type the soils are so depleted now um again nutritionally speaking um you know Soil has so many different things in that are beneficial. Even I'll say magnesium, you know, I always throw that in there. So important. When uh, I worked on the heart floor, there was a lot of people that had heart attacks because they had low magnesium. So important. We have so many people that are on psychotic medications now. Maybe that's because our soils are depleted of lithium, which is a natural thing in the soil. So these are very basic things. Um, that we've forgotten about. We need to look at and rediscover, um, you know, all of these things are so important to our health, not only in a nutritional way, but in a very mental way and also a spiritual way. So, um, and I'm kind of going all over the place because there is really so much to talk about. Um, my, my beginnings and knowledge of plants was you know, walking the forest and, and the woods with my father, um, who had that native um, information that was passed down about the importance of the medicines and nutrition that was all around us. Um, and so that was something that I guess really just kind of stayed with me um, because this is, this is the beginning. This is the foundation of where health, and, and spirituality and medicines really came from. And then later on, um, I began to see um, through my three children how important it was to really um, provide the best nutrition for them because they were all labeled ADHD. So we, we know that food, dyes, all those things play a big part in um, our health. Um, then I became a nurse and then it's kind of like full circle now. Um, I'm seeing that again, we have come farther from our food, knowing where it comes from, knowing what is incorporated in the growth of our food. And also, you know, the fact that our tribe was, was really suffering um, from the Ford toxic dumping, um, we realized that we needed to do something and we needed to do something now instead of waiting for the right thing that needed to be done either via from the people that you know did the dumping or whatnot and our people um are they really can't go out and hunt and gather in that land anymore because it is still toxic um you know they are living on a super fun site still so we weren't getting help from the state because we're only state um, recognized. So there's no funds or if there is that we're not seeing that yet. Um, and so we decided that we needed to do something ourselves and it's better to start doing something now instead of waiting for something to be done. Um, and so that's what we did. Um, we started this farm and we saw it as a we saw it as a chance for our people to reunite themselves with the land again to possibly come out of um the neighborhood or the place where they live that isn't really the best thing and to come over to the farm and 
you know, there's a healing that happens when you take care of plants, when you plant a seed and you see it start to grow and you nurture it and you have all of those, you know, it's like you can see people, they, their self-esteem starts to grow a little bit with that seed and community, you know, starts to grow as other people are actually there on the farm and they, they all have the same philosophy. They're there for a reason, whether it be to plant, grow, volunteer time. Um, it's just the, the unity that you see that happens. It's like this magic, you know, where people don't even know each other and, you know, they, they develop this relationship and it may only be for a day or it may be long-term, but that part I call the other healing part of the farm and that's the spirituality part. And, and I just think it's a wonderful interconnectedness and it also is a way to um, have people realize that this is our future and we can do it and everybody can do this. It's a shared vision and we don't have to depend on the big supermarkets for our health and well being anymore. Um, you know, Sussex, New Jersey used to be all farming community. It's not that anymore. So, part of our vision, too, is also to show everybody that we can take care of ourselves as a community once again and a community isn't only our indigenous community that we're speaking about we're talking about everybody on a, a human level and so that everybody is going to benefit from it because we take care of the the soil we nurture the soil we nurture the plants we nurture the the people that are growing the plants and then it's like this cycle where it's such a give and take situation and it's a it's a beautiful thing and so um we're new we're just getting started um and we've seen really great results so far and we believe with you know the right intentions um that our our farm is going to grow and it is going to be a community um you know when i grew up it was like the village took care of the child. And it, I, I think I really miss that. And I think that that's what I'm trying to establish for everybody now, once again, because um, everybody seemed to have a garden. Everybody seemed to be aware of what was going on with the other person, your neighbor, even you know down the street. And if there was an elderly person that didn't have a garden, um, everybody would give that elderly person food you know, we would take care of that person or that child. And I believe that that is what's really missing uh, today. And, and so therefore, I see this as a chance to um, have everybody realize that everybody can start a garden no matter where they are. And everybody can share this experience. And we can share in unity and community and get back, you know, and, and get our health back once again, which is so important. And to realize that we are resilient and that we, we can be independent and we don't have to depend on these big supermarkets that are giving us food that's basically the same as cardboard, if not worse. Um, and so, yeah, I just, I see it as a healing farm in that way. And so anybody who comes in and visits our farm, we don't have a rigid program. It is, it seems to be attracting people that will get whatever it is they need to get, whether it's just sitting and listening, the elders that come and sit and listen and share their experiences and, you know, suggest certain things here or there, or the young ones that are, absorbing everything and learning everything from the elders or even from us or other people. And so it really is a community that decides um, what is happening on the farm. It's not very well planned out and, and a rigid situation because it's a community group effort and it's evolving and it's ongoing. And so it's just morphing into this, this beautiful thing. But I hope that we all can develop over time in our own way.
For it. Thank you, Micheline. Thank you for sharing that and like your long thought process in actually, you know, creating this, um, this farm. Um, so I wanted to kind of um, just pose a question and then I noticed that there are questions in the chat. So I'd like to go to that right after it. Um, but one question really for all of you and then kind of segmenting it for all of you. Um, I was wondering how COVID really underline the importance of foodways and having some sort of control over your food and local sources of food um, and how the structure of food being so far removed from us developed and how you see that urban gardening is kind of situating itself as a possibility to counter this. So I wanted to start with um, Jamie uh, because you were talking about you know, your travels, wanderings across the US, but really seeking alternative poss possibilities from, uh, from the market-based relationships of exchange to an alternative base. Um, and, but yet you're working, interestingly, with the market to change the market um, in specifically what you mentioned. And so I was wondering if you would just talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I am, everyone has to still pay rent. Unfortunately, we live in like, like Newark is 75% renters, um, actually. Um, and so when we look at economic empowerment, um, within the system that we live in, we have to think about how we can bring, um, especially like, like uh, the urban agriculture community practitioners into, you know, into more resilience. And it has to be in part through um, monetary exchange, you know? So, uh, but there, I love that there's other opportunities like I, um, to engage and just growing. Like a uh, Greater New York Conservancy does that Plot It Fresh program where you can actually um, grow your own food um, um, at like a, in a 10 by eight for like $10 a year or something like that. And then also you can plug into De Tobias's awesome uh, work and programs. There's several gardens, there's so many gardens in every ward that, you know, if you put in, you know, a little bit work into it, you will get fresh produce and it's not the, um, you know, it's, you don't have to purchase the produce. It's just, you know, you're a labor of effort. So I think that by having all of these different approaches, we can reach uh, like kind of more success. Um, yeah, and it, I just think it's also important to have a more like accessible pathway. So the online market, like brings together so many of these farms in a sense of within the system it to be widely accessible by even people that don't really understand like what we're doing. Like, oh, I could get like some lavender, that's cool. Like, you know, and it, oh, that's cool that it like was just grown like in the next board. So, um, and also I just want to touch on Winnie's uh, like question. I think as a nonprofit, so Urban Ag is a nonprofit, um, and her um, basically being able, so I see the, the virtual system as something that can help pay for itself um, so that we're not rel as reliant on grants. Um, I think other ways that nonprofits specifically can share um, access resources and money are through fiscal sponsorships, co-writing grants, um, knowing what's out there. Like, I think, you know, I'm so proud of us all and I'm just gonna end it here because I'm taking a long time. But um, like, I'm really proud of us all in the way that we're all like learning what each of each organization has to offer and we're matching up where it makes sense in a way that I've never seen before in a way that I think that is like really becoming so successful um, and, and just really exciting. Um, so I think I'll end it there. Sorry. That's great. I mean, I'd like to seg actually to, to bias from that um, and just also ask you about, you know, the current moment um, in terms of foodways and local capacities of feeding Newark residents um, and how COVID might have been like a wake up call. Um, and basically, um, you know, I think there are, there are other questions that I'd, I'd love to like pull from the chat, but um, in relationship to uh, Jamie also, I don't know if you might comment with um, Amanjana had this great question for both of you is how you envisioned to meet the growing demand for like online groceries, especially with a large share of shoppers pivoting towards online grocery shopping during this pandemic, these types of accessibility issues. So I just wanted to throw it to you. <laughs> no, no. So first of all, COVID-19 um, 
was uh, a tremendous uh, wake up call for all of us. Uh, and it, it was a tremendous setback uh, because um, we were told that we had to, you know, shelter in place, social distance, don't go outdoors unless it's essential. Um, <clears throat> and luck, thankfully, I work in a field, um, agriculture. I work in a field that is, is essential. You know, you know, you want to see social chaos, stop feeding people and you will see social chaos, you know. And so, um, and so thankfully, I was, uh, I'm in a field where I, um, I had to get up every morning and, and go to work. However, um, like 90 plus percent of my workforce is relied upon on interns and volunteers. And so those folks said, sorry to buy us, we love you, but we're not coming uh, to help out um, until things in Newark get better. Um, and so, um, but what was, uh, what gave me hope and um, I think so many others was the revitalization of the Black Lives, Ma Black Lives Matter movement uh, because uh, these voices um, and which is, you know, international and multicultural, these voices started seeking out Black farmers. And so I got an abundance of emails and phone calls uh, saying, hey, where are, where are our farmers? And we want to support them. And so we've been trying our best to uh, create new farmers in our urban communities. And so uh, with this setback has also created opportunity. And so these opportunities are what we are trying to focus on more so um, than, the, than the drawbacks. And so uh, COVID-19 definitely has disrupted every aspect of our social life. Um, but then there came this um, outcry of justice on all forefronts um, that exposed uh, so many injustices and so many inequalities. Uh, and then one of those inequalities is something that I am very in tune with, which is food inequality. And so, um, and so yeah, and so we're seizing that opportunity. Uh, thankfully, uh, for the past few years, uh, in Newark, we've already been uh, organizing around how do we uh, develop this business model with this mission work that we're doing of creating more healthy food access, uh, especially in urban communities. And so, but people, and I tell people like, look, don't be, if we're not ready today to meet the demands of people wanting to buy food from their local farmers and gardeners, if we're not ready to meet that demand today, do not give up, do not give that, give up hope on us. Please don't give up on us. Just keep in mind that corporations are giving millions of dollars to fail and then they're giving millions of dollars again to fail again. We are giving, on the other hand, on the grassroots level, $5,000 and expected to change the world. And so change on the grassroots level is messy, it's ugly, it's frustrating, um, but we will get it done. Because it's, we're dri we've been driven to do this work prior to COVID-19. We are driven to do this work in the midst of COVID-19. So why would you think we will stop? And so with your support, it only makes us want to go even harder uh, and stronger with this work. And so we have institutions wanting to see this work gets, gets done and see us through this work. And we can't do it without the support, support of those that are watching this, that are plugged in and watching uh, this talk right now. But just know that COVID-19, yes, was a setback. Black Lives Matter kind of revitalized my spirit and so many others to show how much um, this work is needed. Thank you, Tobias, for that. I mean, I, I love how you're underlining the need for collaboration and the fact that, you know, there has been such underfunding, um, but that you've been working so hard with that. Um, and also, um, interestingly, like thinking about Black Lives Matter, and I know there was a focus on, um, I believe, the gardener, uh, uh, Marcus Henderson, activist um, in DC, and how he had been planting on the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone and turning like the park into, you know, a space for gardening. Um, it just shows like that interconnection, right? Um, and so I, I wanted to also um, 
in, interject like one of the questions quickly before um, jumping to Micheline also, um, it, because I have somebody here that is asking about um, how gardens are selling produce to the public. If, if you're for uh, Tobias, you know, and Jamie, like, is it limited to the garden members or is it for the public? Um, no. And if they're bearish offering local food? So um, I'm just going to speak from my perspective is that um, so the gardens and urban farms uh, throughout Newark, and I'm speaking from Newark's perspective, perspective, but there are some urban ag projects going on in Trenton, uh, in Patterson, I was just at an uh, awesome farm and in, in, uh, urban farm garden in, in Patterson, uh, Jersey City. And so um, one is that we, most of us operate uh, under the city's adopt a lot program. And so there's restrictions in that um, alone. Two, not everyone is growing food with a purpose of selling food. There are people who are growing food with the purpose of just they themselves want to have access to fresh locally grown produce and they want to share that with their neighbors and family that's closest to them right and then so there's the smaller percentage in that larger group like myself and others who are looking to uh, who have been working to attach this business model to what we are to the work that we're doing right and so i've decided to do this by way of a community supported agriculture program where you have members um, that supports the work that I'm doing. It helps with strengthening the business model structure uh, that's attached to the work that I'm doing. Uh, and also there's some community buy-in through that process. But then you have uh, the Urban Agriculture Cooperative who, uh, who help with establishing farmers markets, pop-up farm stands, and they just introduced this um, um, online uh, subscription where you can purchase items online. And so we'll all get there at some point, you know, but again, this is very early stages of this really strong demand uh, in result of COVID-19, right? And so. Great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Jamie, did you want to comment at all on that or? I think that was put very nicely. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> thank you. So um, I did want to ask Micheline because um, in thinking about COVID-19 in this moment, um, I mean, a lot of us, I mean, it's it's been just so much for us, right? On so many different levels of, you know, oppression of, of different sorts. Um, and so I was wondering if you might be able to talk about, because you you often um, mention the idea of plants and relationships with plants in the spiritual and as well as healing. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that and also how you might see gardens and tradi traditional knowledges like across different communities um, as a possibility for this um, uh, proximity to uh, getting more closer to spirituality um, in terms of plants and healing. Okay, well, I guess with COVID, um Part of the thing that I noticed is that, um, you know, I would go into the stores and, and I was making masks for people that needed them. So I started to notice that there was um, a lot of fabric, crafts, baking goods, anything to do with something that was creative um, was gone. There, you couldn't find anything. Um, it seemed like people, um, because they were forced to stay home, they were spending more time with their families um, and they were doing something that they haven't really been able to do in a very, very long time, but something that we all used to do a very, very long time ago. And I think that um, it was, it was, it's, it provided us a time to really be a little bit more introspective sharing, caring, and I think it allowed us, and, and I believe we're all creative people in one way or another, we love to create. And when we have that time to sit down and do whatever it is that makes us feel good to create that something, whether it be uh, sewing or gardening or baking or drawing, we want to share that with people, right? So I believe that to me is a part of spirituality it is a part of you know tapping into whatever it is 
and and then putting that good intent and that love into something and then wanting to to share that and i really saw that on a level as far as um in a community i would hear people talking about it that we have more time to spend with our family now we have more time to share stories we're creating stories we're creating more memory memories and and happy memories and of course you know those trying times too but that's what being a family is about so it, it kind of made me look on the flip side about how we were living before that happened and we were and even i was part of that too is part of the daily grind where we would be commuting even further than we ever have our families used to work in communities we didn't travel far we worked in communities we supplied the businesses within the communities those businesses within the communities gave back to the communities because we all knew each other that doesn't happen anymore so everything was always on a, sm a much smaller level and it's not like that anymore so now we're traveling farther <clears throat> excuse me we're not in the community more time is spent away from our community more time is spent away from our family we don't have time you know we'll go out during the day go to work at six o'clock in the morning sorry about that um maybe we leave at five o'clock in the morning and then by the time we work an eight nine whatever hour day we go back in the car and then it's time to go home and then before we know it it's time to make dinner and then it's time to clean up or do the other things you're supposed to do and then if you have kids how much time is left that then there's homework to do so how much time is there really left to be creative and enjoy one another in that way um, and i believe that is a spiritual way or a part of it and so it's that you know the introspective getting to know yourself again getting in tune with what really matters sharing that with your family sharing that with your friends that big part was missing for a really long time um, and so i feel that covid had brought that to us again and that is showing us something that is very important and that we really should think about in our lifestyles today um, will it you know will we come away with um you know more uh, important things or a reawakening of what really matters i don't know i hope so as, as and i don't mean to downplay covid because what really happened is heartbreaking and devastating but i always you know there is sometimes there most of the time there's a blessing in in something that is so awful too so um you know that's my hope again and that's a sense of being back going back to community and and taking care of one another again and our families as well thank you so much michaeline i in thinking about that in creativity and um also community um in thinking about covid um i noticed that there's a question um for tobias to um about what is planned for the eco art and sas ambassadors program this summer given the current covid 19 situation do you have any specific plans or are you concentrated on other things because of the covid situation no um so um we are um so yeah we are developing a series of uh virtual programming uh, mm -hmm. for uh, the rest of the summer months going into the fall um, and we will do some um, activities at the gardens as well. Um, just unfortunately, we have to work within uh, the uh, guidelines that are given to us on the uh, state and, and local city level. And so we are, um, uh, one thing COVID-19 has done is forced us to uh, use technology more um in within our uh organization practices and activities and programming um and so that's a bit frustrating but you know um it's also opportunity to reach larger audiences as well but to answer the quick question more directly um please uh, be on the lookout for uh, future programming and activities uh, throughout the remainder of the summer and going into the fall 
Thank you, Tobias. I wanted to talk a little bit because I know that um, Jamie, before when we were preparing a bit for this program, had mentioned like a few projects that are going on in Newark. And so I was wondering if you might be able to talk about both of them just kind of to think mm -hmm. about how they are working with community or, or not. And like, um, and just how, for example, Tobias, you're able to, um, uh, for the new space on Central Ave in Fairmont, right? Um, how you're able to like conceive of it, you know, how, do, how did you plan that with community and um, to, you know, provide affordable housing connected to it and kind of develop with local businesses. And then also, um, I don't know if Jamie might be able to talk about like other types of things that are happening, like maybe with like the Aero Farm, I believe, um, in New Jersey City, and just like to see like how uh, different folks are coming together with these different, you know, sustainability projects um, from different angles. Okay. Um, all right. So one, I just want to share a little bit about myself. So I, I, I was born in North, grew up in East Orange, lived in Irvington. So North Irvington and East Orange has been a circle of my life. And I grew up in a household of 16. I, ex food insecurity was in, at the top of the list. I experienced um, every social issue imaginable related to poverty. And, um, and so I, I never saw myself uh, doing this type of work. You know, I, the, the arts was my escape from poverty. Um, and, and, so, and so I felt like, you know, doing the projects that I'm doing today, uh, I've never felt like I've been disconnected from the community. And so um, and these projects that we are working on and developing are in communities that are um, that have severe um, social challenges, economic challenges, and so forth. And so and so I just said, look, you know, urban agriculture, no one can really define it. Uh, everyone is trying to see how it can be considered a part of economic development or community development. And so um, I've always been working and developing proposal projects with my colleague, Jacqueline Vito. And, um, and so it just so happened that there was a, a waste management corporation who got fined for illegal dumping in Newark. And that put us an opportunity to be recommended to receive some funding for a community project that we had in mind. And I shared this proposal for this hydroponic farm project that I was, you know, that I had developed some time ago. It was liked and it says, well, if you can get the city to sell you the land, we will fund your project. And so um, within the 20 or so local growers within Newark will be the first ones to go from leaseholders to landowners um, but it's because that, you know, I would say that we've been persistent, you know, with the work that we're doing. So I define success as when um, persistence meets opportunity. And so since 2012, I've been growing in this agricultural field within urban communities, specifically in North. And so just kind of, you know, the opportunity presented itself and uh, that's how this project got to happen. And so um, one of our uh, board members, who is a uh, housing developer, he says to Bias, you know, what are you trying to do? What do you see yourself in the next few years with the organization? I said, well, we want to go from this community-based organization to a statewide organization. Uh, we are developing chapters, uh, a chapter in, Dominic in the Dominican Republic. So we want to, we want to see ourselves beyond this local, this local border. And so he says, well, you know, you have to start, you know, thinking about land ownership. And so, Again, I come from uh, a family of laborers. Uh, I wasn't, you know, they wasn't sharecroppers from the South. They were from North Carolina, but they were never sharecroppers. They were, uh, you know, they worked in other labor fields. And so um, what was drilled to me growing up was like home ownership versus land ownership. And so uh, this boardman was the first one who actually kind of drilled in the importance of land ownership from an organizational perspective, you know, and so, and so he walked me through the whole process of how to bid for property 
in the city of Newark how to uh, write a proposal for property that you want and so forth. And so I had some guidance that led me through that process. And so any development that I uh, take on through Newark Science and Sustainability, uh, we want to do it as green community development. And so, um, and so I just, as an observer um, of what goes on around me uh, and the information I receive um, throughout life, is what leads to these projects that we are developing here. Great, thank you so much Tobias for that. Um, to, uh, Jamie, I don't know if you wanted to comment a little bit about um, different um, projects that are going on. Sure, um, yeah, you know, um, just quickly like, you know, I, I, different projects across, like outside of my, our own, um, uh, purview urban ag I think I explained our like major projects um, actually there's one project where we are we do have some funds for food manager we want to do value-added that's the next step of, of, of this is value-added farm products like kind of like hot sauce or canned products or um, you know connecting to suppliers so as we hope to build this demand for locally hyper locally grown produce like we want to kind of also build our own you know right now our the farmers market uh, online farmers market is retail uh primarily but maybe one day it could be like wholesale to farmers uh you know um or wholesale i'm sorry wholesale to chefs and restaurants um uh, so there's a lot of possibilities there, but we're just trying to grow incrementally. Um, and I think there's, in terms of other really cool things going on uh, within Newark, um, Girls on Bikes is a really cool organization that we've partnered with um, that also, uh, with, through collaboration with the Newark Bike Cooperative, uh, did some delivery um, of produce um last year to senior buildings um so those are like little partnerships that we try to make and you know we pretty much you know are pretty solid in like what our work is thanks Deshaun. um and um but we also um we we look to seek out other um organizations that might like for example with the online farmers market we don't have a Actually, we don't have an office. We don't have, uh, it's, it, we all work kind of virtually, even it, without COVID. Um, ha, uh, so we utilize our urban partners that are involved in this for storage, and then we pay them for their storage, or we utilize some other, or truck, or, or you know, um, if someone has a truck system, one of our partners, then we'll utilize that. So it's, it's kind of like, um, I think that that answers your question a little bit, I hope. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah, I know that's helpful. Um, I, I was just I'm pulling a little bit from this last question that just came in, um, which interrelates with what you were saying is, um, I think is really interesting and in how um, they ask about how, you know, New Newark has been changing greatly and um, this idea of like gentrification versus like building with the community and how um, sometimes like urban art, urban gardening and urban beautification projects end up with um, attracting gentrification. How do you con kind of counter that? I, I actually, I have anecdotal evidence against that. I like one and, you know, Whole Cities Foundation gives us great, um, you know, great grant opportunity. Um, but when the Whole Cities Market came in on Halsey Street, we saw um, very quickly the about like there was like all these development programs, people more quickly were per pushed out of their garden sites. Um, I don't, I, I, I would think, oh yeah, like people, that was the story. Maybe I heard it more often. Oh, you're going to make this community garden here and all of the rent is going to go up. That is not a thing that ever happened that I noticed. Tobias, I don't know if you've noticed it. Uh, Mikey, I don't know if you're like noticing people talking about that. Like, like, what? no, like if anything, development actually what? creates more demand on, um, adopt a lots which are for a dollar so people lose them you know so well gentrification is a real thing i mean there are some, oh yeah i uh, agree with some that cities, some cities that become completely gentrified and move people 
that live there completely out. Um, but when you talk about Newark, so Newark uh, isn't uh, just a small town city. Um, there is, um, we're pretty much, we're pretty spaced out. And so when people talk about uh, gentrifying uh, Newark, I would always say, well, what part of Newark are you talking about? And if they say, well, look at downtown. I says, well, were you downtown 10 years ago? When there was hardly, you know, it was a lot of vacant property. No one was actually living. And what part of downtown are you referring to? And so I like to get more specific when people talk about gentrification in Newark. Um, I like to have more specifics in terms of what location you're referring to, because there's a lot of parts of Newark that need to be transformed. And, uh, and thankfully, there are um, programs and ordinances in place to prevent uh, landlords for taking advantage of new development popping up uh, in, commu in communities. And so um, gentrification definitely is a serious topic. Um, and when it relates to Newark, uh, that really needs like a really kind of broader discussion uh, because I, I would like, my, my go back to that question is always like, you know, well, what part of Newark are you referring to? Great. Um, thank you, everyone. We're actually like at the end of the event time, but um, I did want to just, first of all, thank all of the presenters, um, uh, Jamie, Tobias, Micheline, and really also um, thank you for like discussing these really vital issues. And for Micheline really bringing us, you know, with her last comment about where we are at this moment and how we're able to have a pause to like reevaluate our lives and our relationships and um, mm -hmm. and how we want to go forward. And I think um, what Tobias and Jamie have been able to, and Micheline with her work um, show us is really, you know, projects that are happening right now that are really transforming our community, but also like our relationships to steward, uh, to um, environmental stewardship, to thinking about our health, thinking about alternative systems um, that we can engage upon and they are here. So it's so exciting. Um, so perhaps we can think of our gardens now as possibilities for advocacy, health, and potentially impotently also for freeing us. I love that idea that really Tobias brought out. Um, so thank you everyone <laughs> and, um, and have a really great rest of the evening. Um, I hope you will join us for other um, price engagements in the future. Awesome. Thank you for having me. It's been a great conversation. Appreciate it. Thank you. Blessings to all. Be safe. Yes. Take care, everyone. Hi, Keith. How are you? Hi. The pitch Hi, Hi, Mickey. See you later. Bye. Talk to you. <laughs> See you so much. Hey, John. Yeah. All right. Keith. Good to see you. Okay there, buddy. Talk to you tomorrow. Take care. All right.